Good morning, wonderful people. If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you would please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 today. As we continue our series called The Day of the Lord. The day of the Lord referring to that period of time where Jesus will come, rescue his people, and eradicate evil and darkness from the world. We are not here to put forth timelines or make predictions. The Bible warns against that. But rather, we are here for preparation. We are here for wisdom and understanding and ultimately occasion to preach the gospel to those that are lost. That is part of the point of understanding these things as we see them in the scripture. To warn the hearts of men while there is still time. The Thessalonians, they were concerned. They believed that the day of the Lord had arrived. And so they began to be disturbed by letters and messages of people making false predictions, of people putting together things that they had no business putting together and saying, this is the day of the Lord. We have seen that in our time. Uh, the older someone might be, the more stories they may be able to tell of false predictions of the end of the world and the coming of the Lord. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He said, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed, either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, that is the rejection of the truth and the substitution of a false gospel. He said, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Verse 8. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why did they perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. All right. So he said there will be some things to look for in advance of the coming of the day of the Lord. They were disturbed in their spirit. And he said, don't be shaken from your composure. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And he said, and the man of lawlessness will be revealed. I want to talk about the man of lawlessness today. Man of lawlessness is spoken of in different ways, in different terms, by different descriptions in both the Old and the New Testament. He is someone who will emerge at the right time, and the Bible says, when the restrainer is taken out of the way, allowing him to ascend to the global scene. There has been much speculation as to what the restrainer is, is a fruitless endeavor. All we need to understand is the restrainer is ultimately the power of God stopping him from emerging before the time. There will be a day when the Lord will release him upon the world and he will come accompanied by the activity of Satan. 
which will allow him by dark spiritual power all signs and false wonders to convince the world to go after him. Because he is endowed with the power and the activity of Satan, he will be someone with unmatched, unparalleled charisma, mass appeal, and even displaying what people believe to be miracles. Whatever politician you have ever seen or loved or been compelled by, electrified by their speeches, inspired by their words, motivated by their policies or economic platforms or these kind of things will pale massively in comparison to this figure that will emerge upon the world. They will all be elementary school compared to this man. He will have answers for everybody. He will have solutions for problems that make sense. Many times I've heard Christians say when some kind of evil despot is in the news or in a country or invades another land by force and malicious destruction, people will say, I wonder if he's the Antichrist. It always bothers me a little bit because it will not be the one that you necessarily see coming in that way. It will be the one that you are compelled to like. It's not the one that's obvious. It's not the one that appears menacing on the surface. It is the one that is most compelling even to you. His oratory or ability to speak, to hypnotize people, if you will, to manipulate their minds, their emotions, is spoken of much in the Bible. Daniel, which is sometimes, if you'd like to understand it, is like the Old Testament book of Revelation. Daniel and Revelation, in their prophetic nature, often echo one another. They say at times the exact same thing. Daniel wrote from a long ago. John wrote hundreds of years later in isolation on the prison island of Patmos. And they said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, much of the exact same thing prophetic word. Daniel would say of this man that will uh, emerge, the man of lawlessness, he said, a despicable person will arise. He will come in time of tranquility and seize the kingdom, the kingdom of the world by intrigue. He will be a very intriguing person. How many times do you hear people say sometimes they see a new political candidate on the scene, whether it's in this country or another, and you say, no, they're very intriguing to me. What they're saying is very interesting. This man will ascend above them all. It says, Daniel, he said, by smooth words, he will turn people to godlessness. He will have a mouth uttering great boasts. He will brag that he can do anything, and in many ways, he will be able to deliver on those boasts. John would later write in the book of Revelation, his mouth will be like the mouth of a lion. While there may be much to be said about that, one thing you could infer from that is his mouth is very commanding. It is very compelling. Years ago, while I was preaching on a gospel endeavor in Central Africa, some of our team in the quiet dark of night heard the quiet evening shattered by the crack of a roar of a lion out in the darkness. And it shook your soul. It was unbelievable. And it just sent a shock from head to toe through your body. You will have a mouth like the mouth of a lion. It's not necessarily speaking in volume. You know, of sound, he's it's speaking in command. When he speaks, people will snap to attention and be drawn to everything he says and calls them to do. When the man of lawlessness is revealed, it is important to understand this is a man. This is not some kind of creature from a movie. This is not something from some other place or some other world or from outer space or any such ridiculous nonsense. This is a man born of woman. However, 
empowered and possessed by Satan. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. If you're holding the Bible this morning, we're going to go to a lot of places and we're going to move fast. If you're not holding a Bible, that's okay. Pull out an electronic device. If you don't have that, listen close and write some stuff down. Revelation chapter 13. Be to the right in your Bible. Revelation chapter 13. What are we talking about? The man of lawlessness. Daniel would describe him as a despicable person. The apostle John would call him the beast from the sea. We're talking about the fact that he is empowered and he can do what he does. He has the ability to do what he does by the power and the activity of Satan released from all restraint. Verse 1 of chapter 13 and the dragon, just pause a moment. The dragon is, in other scriptures, very clearly connected to the identity of Satan. The Bible says the serpent of old, the ancient serpent, known as the dragon, the devil and Satan, is what it says. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, sometimes believed to represent the sea of humanity, the seashore of the world. He said, John, writing by revelation from God, he said, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, out of the sea of humanity, having ten horns and seven heads. On his horns were ten diadems, or crowns, symbols of authority and political power. And on his heads were blasphemous names." Come back to that in a moment. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. He's not a leopard. And his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon gives him that. These beasts that it is talked about are also mentioned in Daniel. Uh, given the attributes of other previous ancient kingdoms that have now risen and fallen. Daniel mentions all of those beasts. He mentions a leopard, he mentions a bear, he mentions a lion and these kind of things. This man will embody attributes of all of those kingdoms in one. Says he will have ten horns and seven heads and diadems or crowns. He doesn't actually, for those of you who are very artistic and want to draw a freakish picture, go right ahead. That's not what he is. Those things mean things. What they mean is very clearly described in chapter 17 of Revelation. Turn to the right a little bit. What that is saying is he will unify the kingdoms of the world unto himself. He will collect and devour all power. That's why it says in the very next verse, the dragon gave him his power and his authority. He will devour them all and become the kingdom of the world. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9. Watch now. Pay attention close. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Who's that woman? Verse 18 of the same chapter, look. The woman which, whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So some great capital city from which this global power reigns. That's what the woman is. The seven heads of the seven mountains, verse 10. They are the seven kings. They are seven rulers or powerful nations, if you like. Five have fallen, one is, the other one has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. Verse 11, the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven. So he is one of these seven, but he will eat the rest, not literally, figuratively. He will consume these kingdoms and he becomes the eighth and only. You follow? Everybody all right? And he goes to destruction. Now the ten horns, verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, 
and they give their power and authority to the beast. Okay, so it all makes sense. He emerges out of the sea onto the world scene, empowered by the dragon, giving power and authority, and he consumes all of the kingdoms unto himself. At first, he portrays himself as one of them, as one of many in an alliance, and he takes them all and becomes the only one left. He will do so, the Bible says, with power, signs, and false wonders. This is stated very clearly in both the Old and New Testament. He will do so convincingly, overwhelmingly, with miraculous power, which will be brought by the assistance, the partnership, with a false prophet, a false religious world leader, will accompany him and assist in his demonic, satanic takeover. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. John continuing to write, he said, then I saw another beast. This is the second. This is not what we just saw. He said, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Again, this is a man. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. Perhaps the lamb indicates on the surface he is peaceful. He is disarming. He is palatable. He perhaps is soft and compassionate in nature, in demeanor, in tone. But when he speaks, he speaks as a dragon. How does the dragon speak? How does Satan speak deceptively? Every time he speaks, the Bible says, whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He has been deceiving from the very beginning. The dragon, we see him speaking all the time from the book of Genesis on. What has God said, Eve? Adam, what did he say? Well, he said, and they quote it back to him, that if we eat of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, we will surely die. The dragon speaks. God did not say that, for in the day that you eat of it, he knows that you will become like God. And he appeals to their ego. He appeals to the nature of idolatry in their own flesh to be gods unto themselves, and the dragon deceives. That's what this man will do. He will speak. He will look like a lamb. He will speak like a dragon. Verse 12, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. He has all the authority, meaning he has a world stage. He has a platform. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. We'll come to that in a moment. He performed great signs, the second beast, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Understand something. He really does that. That's not a magic trick. He's not an illusionist. He's doing that. Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. All right. So this false prophet, he completes an unholy trinity. Okay, what do you have in the Lord? You with me still? All right, got some blank looks going on out there. Come on now. Steam coming out of people's ears right now. It's, what? Listen now, who is God? You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does, the God, what does God say of the Lord Jesus in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 22? Don't have to turn there. Just listen close now. Jesus the Nazarene, there is the Savior. There is the God-man, fullness of God in bodily form. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him. What do you have in this guy? You have the beast emerge on the scene of the world. A man 
presenting himself as a false savior with all the solutions, all the answers, all the fixes to the problems that nobody could ever solve. He comes onto the world scene. Where does he get his power? From the dragon who always wanted to be God, giving him his power and his authority, accompanied by a false Holy Spirit, the false prophet who calls fire down from heaven in the sight of men. And when they say, what should we do about this? He says, worship the beast who is possessed by the devil who wants to be worshiped. That's what this is. It is a counterfeit. It is a fraud for the very nature of the true God. That's what he ultimately wants. It's very important to understand. Even perhaps, perhaps, don't, please don't leave here and be crazy online today. (laughs) I was at church today. Jesus is coming tonight. Don't say that. Don't, don't do it. But what do we have? We might even have this man mimic a false resurrection whose fatal wound was healed and all the world wondered after him. And he steps onto the world scene believing perhaps to have been dead or was certainly going to be dead. Comes out of the certain grave in some way. I'm not saying anything I'm not saying. I'm just saying that what the devil wants to do is offer a counterfeit for everything that is the way, the truth, and the life. And the way, the truth, and the life rose from the dead and appeared to over 500 witnesses. It is possible that he does this too in some way to deceive the masses. All right, Miss Vivian, I'll do that. Which brings me to my next point. I love her. Happy to have you in church today, Miss Vivian. I'm glad you're feeling better. How about a hand for Miss Vivian? Been in the hospital. You push me too hard, I'll preach too long. (laughs) He is empowered by Satan. And what will he seek to do with this power? He will reshape the whole world. He will reshape and conform the world to his image. Verse 3 of Revelation chapter 13. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. Now remember, those also represent nations, so I don't know all what this means. His fatal wound was healed, but nevertheless, this is the point. The whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. How did he do it? How could he do it? Let's follow him. What else does he have to tell us to do and to be? And he will begin to use that to reshape the world. Daniel says in chapter 7 in the Old Testament, he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand. He will restructure the very fabric of society. The laws of morality, of culture, of tradition, he will wipe the slate clean and he will present a new standard of righteousness that is only darkness. And people will take it. They will devour it. It will appeal to their sinful nature. It will appeal to the desires of their flesh. It will appeal to everything God condemns. He will say is righteous and everything God says is righteous, he will say is lawless. That's what he will do. He will reshape the entire economy, the economic system of the world. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16, look. It says, and he, this is the speaking of the second beast on behalf of the first, causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man. A man, his number is 666. Okay. So I have to warn you again not to be crazy. I remember, I remember when it happened. I was a teenager, and there was a Bible teacher in a Sunday school class, God bless him. And he said, you know what the mark of the beast is, kids? It's the barcode that they scan your items at the grocery store. 
And I didn't know a lot, but in my mind I thought, I don't think it is. I don't think that's it. And some time went by, and they're like, you know what it is? It's the ability to pay online. That's what it is. You're paying Amazon online. You're participating in the mark of the beast. I'm like, well, I hope not, because... <laughs> You know what it is? It's those smartphones. You know, they're tracking you guys, and you're putting your financial information in there, and it's the mark of the beast. I don't think so. It doesn't matter. Here's the point. They know what they're doing. It says it's his name or the number of his name. This isn't a trick. This is a call for loyalty. And they willingly and voluntarily say, stamp my life, brand my soul in loyalty to the beast and to his world system. And he says, nobody that re anybody that refuses that will never be able to buy or sell. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, slave or free. You have to identify yourself as loyal to him and his system. And thereby he makes himself, again, in the place of God, the center of it all and the sole provider to all of mankind for everything that they need. Again, in an attempt to supplant God as the provider for our needs. He will reshape religion. He will clean out all religion and turn it on to himself. Daniel chapter 11. It's time to go to Daniel. Hold your spot. We'll come back. Daniel chapter 11, right of middle in your Bible. We are talking about the man of lawlessness and his reshaping of the world. He will change times. He will change laws. He will change the economy. And what he really wants to do is change religion says he will be, he will sit, and he will present himself. We read it already. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, displaying himself as being God. All right, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Daniel's prophetic word about these same things. Then the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods and he will prosper until the indignation is finished for that which is decreed will be done. Verse 37, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women. When you, you don't see very many politicians where that's their description, I'll tell you that. <laughs> My wife's going to tell me I shouldn't have said that later. You watch. That he shouldn't have said that part. Nor will he show regard for any other God, for he will magnify himself above them all. People have said over the years, well, I think that the religion, the false religion in the end times, and they'll put forth a false religion now, and there are many. They will say, I think it is this organization or it is this religion passing itself off as God. And maybe that's the one that's going to emerge. Absolutely not. He is going to mop all of these off the table of the world. And he is going to make him say, he says, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. He will show no regard for any God other than himself. He displays himself as being God. He himself will be the false savior. And he himself will require the worship of all people under the penalty of death to do otherwise. He will not tolerate the worship of any other God, even if it's a false God. He must be God all by himself. And so he will change the world religion to be the savior of all mankind. And he will have a zero tolerance for anybody else, anywhere else. And in so doing, he will persecute the saints of God to death. Revelation chapter 13. Verse 7 says it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him to make war with the saints. 
Daniel chapter 7 says, waging war with the saints and overpowering them. It says he will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. Look at Revelation chapter 17. Chapter 17 and verse 6. John said, and I saw the woman, remember the capital city, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, John said, I wondered greatly. I mean, he was in shock. He was astounded. There is nobody. There is no person. There is no religious entity anywhere on the face of the earth that will produce the vicious gall in the man of lawlessness more than those who represent the true Savior, Jesus Christ. That will be his ultimate singular target. And it says the great city and those who dwell in it, probably him at the helm of it, will be drunk with the blood of the saints and the witnesses of Jesus. And he will be ultimately defeated solely by that same Jesus. Right? You needed that one, didn't you? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, The lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Revelation chapter 19. Speaking of the coming of Jesus and John's vivid description, understand, what is Jesus? He's referred to often as two, uh, the characteristics of two animals. He is what? Lion and the lamb. He comes as a lamb without blemish or spot to offer himself as a sacrifice willingly for the sins of the whole world. He will return the second time as the lion of the tribe of Judah conquering and in victory. Revelation 19 and verse 11, it says, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like the flame of fire and on his head are many diadems or crowns, true authority, True power, the true kingdom is coming. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. Again, the sword, the double-edged sword, is the living word of God. It says, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who is he coming for? Verse 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war with him who sat on the horse and against his army. And so we will soon see what it means that the Lord will slay the man of lawlessness by the appearance of his coming with the breath of his mouth. So Paul comes to the Thessalonians and he says, calm down. Somebody sent you a letter, mess you up. He said, I need to remind you. He said, when I was with you, I told you these things. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed who will display himself as being God and the Lord Jesus says in his first letter, he says he will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel. Paul is coming to Thessalonica and he's saying, that hasn't happened yet. So don't get shook by some letter from a fraud that the day of the Lord has come. But he assures them, 
It's coming in power and great glory. Would you bow your heads this morning? As we contemplate this question for your heart today, whoever you may be, wherever you may be listening or watching from in this room and beyond. Are you at this hour? Named as part of the armies of heaven. Made white and clean by the blood of Jesus on the cross. The Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross and we come to believe in him by faith. Listen now. It says in Colossians, he rescued us from the domain or the kingdom of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Right now as you sit here today, to which kingdom do you belong? There is no middle. There is no opt out. We either sit here this morning as a member of the domain of darkness or the kingdom of God's beloved son. Somebody say, I'm not sure, Wes, I don't know. How would I be sure? The Bible says in him also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. When did you believe? When did you hear the good news of the gospel and were cut to the heart and realized your need for a savior and that you couldn't rescue yourself by good deeds or man's religion or ritual and you called unto the Lord to be saved? When did that happen? You say, I'm not, Wes, I'm not sure. I don't know if that's ever happened and I don't feel at peace today. The Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace a mighty God, an everlasting Father. And he can give you that peace right now. He can cleanse you of your sin. If you'll merely turn from sin, believe on the Lord, call upon his name to be saved. Take a moment right now with your head bowed. There's no magic words. There's no special way. Is it true in your heart? And surrender to Jesus today and let him by miracle make you a new creation.